So again, when we came here, it was kind of like, okay, we're in America, and we're going to make it big. And my dad actually told um, during an interview in an American embassy that he was going to play with B.B. King. You know, it was a given. He was going to come to America and play with B.B. King because that's what he was going to do. Um, but of course, when he got here, especially to Hollywood out of all places, he realized that there were lots of people who wanted to play with B.B. King, <laughs> who were convinced they were going to be famous, right? Um, and he was already in his 40s, so he was, by Hollywood standards, older than the normal age of, what, 13 when he met him, right? Um, so it didn't quite work out the way that he thought, and he was disappointed. But never fear, he had a mistress back in Soviet Union, so he quickly broke up with my mother and said, I'm going to go get my girlfriend now, you know, because uh, she's going to help me make money. Um, as a musician, he's a great musician, but he just didn't have that, that business sense. So he never could quiet, get used to the crazy Hollywood cutthroat type of a business mm -hmm. style. You know, in, in Russia, it was things were just given to him. Here, go play here. Go play there. But here, he had to actually go and ask. He just was not having it. So he brought, in, brought back his mistress. And at this point, my mom and myself and my little sister are left completely alone in the middle of Hollywood. Um, we don't speak the language. We don't know the customs. I mean, it's crazy. He brings my, my stepmother. And she is one of those Romanese who would tell fortune for a living. So you know, I mean, there are stereotypes. But sometimes they're based on some realities. That's what she did because she had work that way. People would come to her asking for fortunes. There are people who call the, the 800 line numbers, right? <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. And they make really good money, too, those people that work in those. Um, so they opened the psychic shop because the music thing just was not working out. He was still performing. Um, in fact, if you go on YouTube and you look him up, there's some really embarrassing videos. <laughs> Are you going to tell us his name or is it in the book? It's in the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just don't tell him I sent you. I won't. Actually, he's very proud of them. Um, and my stepmother is in some of those videos, too. Um, and so they open this psychic shop and people start coming. And my dad all of a sudden goes back to this, the past, you know, my great grandmother, who was. Go ahead. Just ask, what year did you come to? 1990. So it's right before the fall of the Soviet Union, which I guess was a, a, a one good thing that came out of it. Um, so my father was always interested in the occult, and so am I. I, I won't lie. I read about mm -hmm. it. I write about it if I can. I just like the supernatural part of, of our existence. I think there is something to it. I don't know what it is yet, um, but you know, so many years ago, we didn't know that we were made out of these tiny particles or that we were going to have these things that we can speak into and hear our parents from across the ocean or something, you know? So you never know. Everything is possible. Um, but he got really heavily into it. See, I'm moving this way so you can see me better. Because <laughs> it kept looking back and forth. Um, and uh, back in Russia, we didn't get American films on television. It was like, if you did, it was once a year maybe, and it was a big deal. I remember skipping school you know, to go see, to see Friday the 13th. <laughs> it was like a thing. You know. Mostly we got actually Brazilian uh, novellas on television, um, like South Southern America, American novellas that are really popular now, I guess, on some TV networks. That's what we watched. So, but because my parents had so many contacts in the industry, they uh, smuggled the movies. You know, so my dad's favorite genre was horror. So I remember growing up and trying to go to sleep and then hearing the zombies, <laughs> the vampires, and thinking that this is crazy. <laughs> Who would make a movie about people jumping from the ground and attacking? I think it's, I'm talking about the, the Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> it's like embedded in my mind, you know? Um, but he was always into it. You know, that's, that's one fascination we share. It's just anything that's kind of macabre and unexplained, right? So he had this chance to really get into it here. And he got very heavily into the occult once we came to Los Angeles. Uh, so much that he started performing exorcisms. And he had a steady flow of clients. And most of them were not Russians or Romanese. They were American. Uh, many times he had to sign a vow of secrecy because there were Americans who would not want their name in the paper. 
You know, they believe their house, their old 30-year-old mansion is uh, haunted, and they need someone to come and exercise it, you know. And my dad would sign the papers. Um, I set in on actually one of these exorcisms, and uh, I didn't sleep for months after. <laughs> I think that's funny, right? But with the same token, you know, if there's a movie that comes out that deals with any kind of a cult, like especially exorcism, I have to watch it. <laughs> it's like one of those things where you come back to the scene of the crime. I have to see it, even though I'm so deathly afraid of all of that. Um, so, you know, he started getting into that really heavily, and he was doing really well, but at the same time, that kind of work is really draining. Because most of the time, he said, people who came to him were not at all possessed. They were just in need of help. You know, they were either depressed, or they had you know, multiple personality disorder. <laughs> just, and he would always say, you know, you go and check yourself out. First go to the doctor, see if there's anything else you can do. Um, but it's funny how some of these people just insisted that, no, you know, the reason why I'm so unlucky is because there's a demon in me. And he would say, well, maybe, maybe it's just because you need to change your diet. <laughs> but they would insist, no, 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 it's because of this. Um, um, and so I started going to Hollywood High, and because my parents were incomplete, just, just disarrayed. My mom was just falling apart. And only now, after writing the book, I understand why. Back then, at 15, I thought, well, she's just not being a good mom. You know, she's drinking, she's neglecting us. Um, but now I see it. I see the whole picture of, of what was happening. And so I decided that I'm going to take control of my life um, at 15, and I'm going to become an American. That became my goal. I mean, it was like a serious goal, like when you say, I'm going to lose weight you know, in, in a year. For me, it was, I'm going to be an American. And in my mind, what that meant was, first of all, you have to learn the language. Because I could not stand going to a bookstore and not being able to read a book. And I kept trying. I kept thinking, well, maybe, maybe today I can read better. And everything was just gibberish to me. I would open a page, and I wouldn't understand a word. So I got a dictionary, and I started reading classics, you know, like Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, things that I read in, in Russia. Now, Russian education, just to one positive thing to say about it, you know, we read books like that at a very young age. Um, there was no twilight for us. Everybody knows Twilight? Mm -hmm. Fifty Shades of Grey? No Fifty Shades of Grey in Soviet Union. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm going to read the stuff that I already know. Uh, it's going to be easier to understand, but I couldn't. And I was so frustrated that I remember I went to my ESL um, teacher, which ESL is English as a second language. And I said, you know, I need to get rid of my accent. She said, why? Accents are nice. I said, well, I want to be an American. So tell me how to do it. She said, you know, honey, I can't. You know, there's no way, there's no formula for becoming an American. Um, but if you want to read books, classics are really difficult to read for someone who doesn't have the grasp of the language. Why don't you try something easier? So she suggested romance novels. Mm -hmm. And so I learned most of my English oh. by reading <laughs> romance novels, <laughs> yeah, historical romance novels. Right. So I would so, say bonnet for a hat <laughs> and, and you know, say, where's my parasol? And my high school friends are, parasol? What, what is that? Um, and here's a little funny story that I like to tell because I just like to embarrass myself sometimes. Um, but I would read these historicals, right? Usually Harlequin because they came, you know, the book club, you get four every month. So I signed up and everything and I'm reading and I'm translating things that I can't understand and so Phrases start coming up, such as you know, burning, burning loins, burning loins, burning loins. Because remember, this is what Romance 20 stuff. years ago. You were not really allowed to just no, out and say it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so burning loins, and then there was something, um, something bulge. <laughs> Can you help me? Something bulge. What? what? Throbbing, bulge. Throbbing, bulge. Throbbing bulge or something bulge. like that. Oh. Something with like when it. We're not going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't finish that part of your book. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I said. What did I say? Was it wrong? I think it was, yeah. Okay. 
I can't remember exactly. So I started looking in the dictionary, and I'm thinking, you know, burning pork chops is not make sense for, for the loins part, because this is what the dictionary tells me. Um, and I'm like, well, in this scene, pork chops just don't fit into it. Um, so then, um, and I couldn't ask anyone, you know, because I thought, well, what if it's like really bad or, or like I had a sense of what was going on. So that was funny because I went to a bookstore salesperson who uh, used to save romances for me because she knew I was a regular and I had to, I had to have my fix. And um, she said, oh, uh, you know, this is like sexy stuff. This is like, this is what they're doing. And, and, and by this time I'm 16 and she goes, don't you know about sex? You know, because sex ed and all that. Well, where I'm from, you know, parents didn't really talk to kids about sex. It was kind of like the old-fashioned way. You find out when the time comes. Um, and hopefully, you're not too surprised. Um, and so she said, you know, don't you don't you know anything? And this is gonna sound weird, but I said, well, no, I don't know anything about sex, but I know about pornography. Like, is that what that is? And she kind of just looked at me like, what? <laughs> well. <laughs> One of my relatives, when I, back in the Soviet Union, she was older than myself and my cousin. My cousin Jean and, and, and I were like best friends, like sisters basically. And we were almost the same age. So her half-sister, who was about 10 years older, one day decided that she, we needed to learn about sexuality. And in Russian schools, that was not taught. I mean, you couldn't go even to a bookstore and buy a book on the subject. So she said, you know, we're gonna go see an educational movie. <laughs> <laughs> and just like everything else in the Soviet Union, uh, pornography was not legal, just like rock and roll, you know, and many, many different things. Um, and she said, well, you know, we have a, a theater here that shows educational movies. <laughs> so, and we first we said, well, you know, it's okay, we don't really want to know about it. And she said, well, it's either that or you're going to get in, our clo in my closet and there's a peephole and then you can just watch me with, with my boyfriend. And we said, no, it's okay, let's do education. <laughs> So we go into this underground basement kind of a thing, uh, and there's a huge line of people, um, and everybody's paying to get in, and it's literally a basement with a bunch of chairs, like metal chairs, and there's a sheet drawn across the back, and, a, and an old rusty projector. And we watched one of these French or even English movies, and I swear, I stared at that wall so hard <laughs> most of the time. Um, and my cousin too, we just, we were just, we, it was an experience that we couldn't even talk about to our, to each other. Like after we, it was done, we just thought, we didn't understand, you know, can you imagine not speaking about things like that at all and then seeing something like that? <laughs> Although now thinking back, it was a really well done film. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, it was, it was definitely. Um, so, you know, American experience was really different for me. Um, I started, like I said, I, the whole American, you know, becoming an American thing really worked, I think, because I forced myself to learn the culture really, really quickly. So much so that I felt more American than anything else for a long, long time. I didn't have any friends from different cultures. I didn't tell people I was Romani because it was just easier to say, um, you know, American or Greek or Armenian. Because usually when you say Romani, then you have to explain a lot. Um, and especially I know that now, now that I've started telling people, because I get these really strange reactions sometimes, so I'm still getting used to them. It's probably something else I need to record. I need to just carry a recorder with me, I think. It's a good idea. <laughs> um, I had this experience a few months back. This woman comes up to me after uh, a reading that I did, just like this one, and she's really, really nice. And she's very politely telling me, she says, you know, you don't look like, like a gypsy. You don't look like a, like a gypsy. <laughs> yes, that's what I said. I said, well, I, I, didn't try, I didn't want to be confrontational, so I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, you don't look like you like to fight. My God. <laughs> so this got to be coming from somewhere. So I started asking her questions. And she said, well, you know, these shows that they, they have on TV, like uh, My Big Fat American Gypsy Wedding. Anybody watches that? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> heard of it at least, right? Great wedding. Oh, there's a whole television reality show. Really? Every week they have episodes oh, yeah. about different gypsies. They're usually actually from south, from like Atlanta, 
Like we don't got anything there. I lived in the South. Well, you should see the, the people that they show in these shows are very similar to, um, for example, Jersey Shores. I don't know if you've seen that show. <laughs> good, good for you. So yes, they fight a lot. Is know. that on cable? It's TLC, I think, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I took that not as an insult, it was just something, this is what this person was seeing, and this is how she was judging the entire culture, because when you watch a show like this, they constantly tell you, Gypsies like to do this, <laughs> you know? Like they had this thing on one of these episodes where they have a diet of cucumber and vinegar <laughs> that you eat to lose weight, right? Mm -hmm. And these gypsy girls, they do that, and they said, gypsies to lose weight eat a diet of cucumber and vinegar, <laughs> right? And it's, it's very like generalized, you know? Gypsies like bling on their bras <laughs> because they wear a lot of Swarovski crystals. <laughs> these families that they, they show. So I thought that one really, great thing about doing a book like this would be just to talk to people and see with you guys, I don't know, you, you know too much. <laughs> so I don't know how much I can teach you. But it's just talking to people and explaining just a little bit about the culture um, and trying, sometimes it feels like telling someone who's, who's believed for a long time that Earth is flat, telling them that, that it's round. They almost cannot really envision it. You know, what do you mean a gypsy doesn't steal? You know, what do you mean a gypsy doesn't beg? What do you mean you have a college education? You know, things like that. Um, but I think it works, even if it's a little bit one person at a time. Um, I think just meeting someone from any culture and talking to them can give you a better perspective than, you know, really than reading hundreds of books or watching television. So I'm hoping to accomplish that, you know, however I can. Um, how much time, what time is it? That quarter up. Okay. Maybe I can do, uh, I forgot my book. Yeah. Where I usually read from. So I'm going to try to read this piece. Look, it just opened. <laughs> <By itself. laughs> See, you. come on. <laughs> the curse is lifted. That's right. That's, that's all it took. Oh. Actually, my dad, he mentioned it. He said, now that you've written a book, maybe you're your great-grandmother will leave us alone. And I said, I kind of like her. I actually did. I did research on her, and she was also a midwife. So you never know, you know, that these rumors, the way people are, are painted, um, and then hundreds of years later, that's all you have left of them are these rumors. That's why family history is so important, I think, is because then you can leave a record, and then nobody can make, make up stories. You know? It sounds like you have a lot of uh -huh moments, like, like the whole, oh, yeah. Yeah, because I just, thought I knew everything already, you know. I mean, how much... And it just fills in those gaps. And, and then for us to read about it, it even makes us more learned. And, and it's just, we have our own aha moments yeah. ourselves. I've noticed that a lot, is that we think we know everything that we need to know about ourselves and our families, because we grew up together, right? And then yet so many, probably 80% of what we know is wrong. Even, even reasons for why people do things or why things happen. Um, we can carry those, like, grudges, let's say, for many years, not knowing that we were all wrong about them, you know? And nobody bothers to find out and, and to ask questions. I was amazed that when I started asking questions, even my dad, who usually doesn't talk a lot about the past, he just opened up. It, he wouldn't stop talking. He was just telling me things that I never, oh my gosh, um, he told me this thing, and this does not leave this room. <laughs> you know, and he said, he said, you know, your your grandparents didn't have a perfect marriage, and I always thought that they they did. They lived together for over fifty years, you know. And my grandfather, when he died, the last thing he said was my grandmother's name. So you know, that's pretty romantic. Um, but my dad said, you know, your grandmother and your grandfather weren't together for for quite a few years. I mean, they lived together, but they weren't at, together as a couple. And your grandmother, at sixty five had a lover of 24, oh, wow. you know, and she to find to out him. that, she came to get him. Yeah, to find out that about oh, somebody in your family, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not a normal now, not a normal. Right, cougar like, is what they yeah, were for. Yeah, yeah. 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 I kind of thought, wow, my grandma was a cougar. <laughs> <laughs> were you going to say something? I, I was going to say, going back cultural, Myths, lies, really. Uh, I, um, my mother said that when she was a child, sometimes people would say to their children, if you were naughty, 
the gypsies were stealing. Mm -hmm. But did you know uh, that there was a time in history when gypsy children were for forcefully taken away from, from their parents and oh. separated? The wow. gypsy children were stealing. They were because they were not considered uh, proper parents. Okay. They were not putting okay. their kids in regular schools. Okay. Um, and this was, you know, a hundred years ago at least. Oh, I can tell you so many stories. I, like I said, when I started doing research, I found out just really quickly, when the gypsies first came out, first came out of India, like I said, it was about 11th century or so, um, they didn't voluntarily leave India. There was a lot of unrest, social unrest and political unrest um, that made them kind of have to move. And also, many were taken as slaves by people that were coming in and you know taking over the regions in that area. And when they made it to Egypt first, they stayed there for so long that once Romanis were seen in Europe, most Europeans thought of them as Egyptians. And that's where the word gypsy comes from. Uh, most people thought gypsies were from Egypt, which was not correct, obviously. Um, the first country to accept Romanis, to say, you know, come and you can stay on our land, were Armenians. It's kind of strange. There's about 60 gypsy dialects that are rich in Armenian words to this day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry? You know, there's always, there was so much turmoil going on because it was really the dark ages, not just for Europe, but for most of that, that part of the, uh, the world. They, they didn't belong anywhere. So as soon as there was something going on and so much unrest, they would move on or they would be taken as slaves. I mean, that continuously happened. Um, because from my research, even when they were trying to assimilate, many times they were not allowed to. Um, for example, when they entered Europe, this was about 1400s or so. So this came right, I think, after the plague, right? Mm -hmm. 1400s. So they came at the most, it's the worst time for, for strangers to show up in an area, in a, in a disease-ravaged area. So they, they, they became kind of like the scapegoats. You know, oh, these people come in, and they're speaking the, the devil's language because nobody could understand them. And you know, the church was doing their own thing at that time. And they were saying, oh yeah, you know, it's their fault. And it was also the fault of the, the mentally um, yeah. ill and you know, the Jews and uh, the Indians who made it that way after the uh, Crusades or something. I mean, there were so many different groups that were targeted. <coughs> yeah and then after that. And um, in some Eastern Euro European countries, um, the people, the government, went as far as branding the gypsy just to make sure that everyone knew who they were. So the women, their left ear would be cut off, and that's how you would know that this person is a gypsy. And the man would be branded on a chest. Um, so even if you were trying to assimilate you know, in, in an area like that, it would be impossible to do. Many living in Romania. That's the area I'm talking about. Yeah, I just didn't want to name <laughs> the countries, but it was mostly Eastern Europe. Uh, gypsies remained slaves in the in the area of Romania until late 1800s. All everyone was a slave. It was a a, a, a culture that didn't have a repre representation of any kind. They were only taken as slaves. Um, and so you know, it's a, it's a really dark history. What if we go? talking about it. And I know, like you said, you know, some of them are very, very, um, there's a lot of animosity back and forth. And I completely believe it because I think, you know, ignorance, ignorance is within and without. So you cannot say that all Romani are just these great people, they're humanitarian, they love everyone. There's some people who still remember the past in every culture, and they live according to it. So there are plenty of Romani, especially the older generations, who are not very trusting. They simply cannot, they can't do it because they've seen differently. Um, and hopefully that's changing. You know, it needs to change from both sides, like I said, from inside and from the outside. But I wanted to read something funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, for the rest of it, you can read the book, <laughs> right? So this is uh, about our first trip. My mom and I went on our first trip to the grocery store when my parents first divorced, so no English, no help. 
I once heard a rumor about immigrants who, unable to read English, had mistaken cat food for canned tuna. That unwelcoming image was wedged in my mind as mom and I stepped through sliding doors of the local supermarket on our first official shopping trip alone. First things first, mom said as we pushed our cart down the bright aisles. We need butter. <laughs> Her black pumps echoed against the canyon of freezers stuffed with food. She wore a gray dress with intricately carved silver buttons down the front. With her freshly curled and styled hair, she looked like a Mediterranean Jane Seymour. <laughs> when she'd spend an hour dressing up, I had complained, worried we'd draw too much attention. I was right, people stared, not only because of her opera-ready makeup, but also because she shouted in Russian to me <laughs> as if we were miles apart. And living in LA, you probably have come across that, right? <laughs> yes. I do that to my kids now. So. <laughs> the heels and the crimson nails weren't too bad. We came from a culture where outside excursions meant people would be checking you out, forming opinions behind your back. You absolutely had to look your best. God forbid you went to the downstairs, ba downstairs bakery and you're in your sweats and slippers. Eventually, the neighborhood would learn of your poverty. Party invitations would be withdrawn and rumors of mental illness would circulate. <laughs> it was the volume of my mother's voice that drove me to pretend I didn't know her that day. For the first time, I was ashamed of my language. Do you see butter, Oksana? Mom bellowed. Anybody familiar with Eastern European cooking practices will understand the value of good butter. If you don't use a stick of the stuff in your recipe, you're either a miser or a lousy cook. We had found the dairy section, and with it, our first dilemma, too many varieties. Butter, according to Merriam-Webster, is a solid edible emulsion obtained from cream by churning. How many different ways of churning are there? How many kinds of cream? Ask yourself that question next time you go to the grocery store. <laughs> I miss the days when I'd walk up to our local market's dairy counter, ask the brightly lipstick Helena Leonidovna for a kilo of butter, and be on my way. Oksana, what does this mean? My mother asked. I squinted at a beige top tub mom pointed to, studying it with the curiosity of an archaeologist. Fat free? I don't think that's good. <laughs> Why not? What does this fat free mean? I envisioned a golden cloud of creamy mass floating in a sparkly sky, blobs of fat swirling around it in fancy free abandon. And I said, it means it has way too much fat. Fat has complete freedom. It has taken over this <laughs> Of course, we didn't buy it. Um, where is your mother now? She, my mom is in, Hall, uh, in Las Vegas. That's where we all, most of us live. My dad is still here in Los Angeles playing. He's not doing his psychic thing anymore, but he's still playing. Um, uh, there's a lot of funny parts in here, but you know, if I read the whole thing to you, then... <laughs> Um, do we, should we do some questions? I don't want to keep you too long, you're probably you're hungry and, yeah. and you know, it's LA. Did your mom ever remarry? My mom never married again, no. And, and did your dad stay with the girlfriend? Yes, and they're yes. driving each other crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he calls me and he complains. Nobody loves me. She, she's going to put me in the grave. <laughs> and, you know, all I can say is that you picked her. <laughs> My stepmother belongs on Jersey Shores, like that show. Mm. That's how she acts. Mm. She's banned from a bunch of casinos on the strip <laughs> from, her, from her antiques. In Las Vegas. Wow. <laughs> She's on the black books. She can enter the casinos. <laughs> you know, she loses at the table, she starts fighting with the dealer. Like fist fighting with the dealer. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess some people like to fight. You know, not me particularly. The word Romani, is that from Romania? Is it related to that or is it Romani? No, that's a good question. No, it's actually a word that comes from an Indian or Hindu word, dom, which means people. So the origins are in the Sanskrit language. Anybody else? So Sally, in the early part of the writing of the book, we were kind of concerned that, you know, when, as you told more of the story, that we'd be kind of crossing lines and whatnot. Now that it's all done, and you're Right. Are you have you found situations that has some of that come to uh, food or have you really had 
You know, luckily, no. It seems like family is really accepting so far. Uh, my Romani family hasn't read it. Most of them are back in Russia. My dad doesn't read English, which is good. <laughs> you know, my stepmother, I don't think, knows what a book is. Um, so, but I actually have my cousin is sitting in the back right there from Armenian side. He is a very talented musician. He plays in a, in a metal band called uh, Hexen, and he is really, really Hexen? amazing. Hexen. It's a thrash metal. And he, he picked up a guitar and he started playing. That's what, I mean, he just taught himself. And he's not even from that side of, he's from the wrong side of the camera. <laughs> so you know, life is strange. But he says he liked it. So, and most people that have read it in my family are really accepting of it. And you know, I try to stay away from, uh, like the first few drafts were really heavy. And I think even when we, if we look back at our journals, if any of you journal, uh, they tend to be really dark, you know, because you tend to write about the negative parts, you know, in your life. And that's what happened when I was first writing the book. But a little bit at a time, I realized that it, it, it's not all that bad, you know? You can describe an event, and you don't have to cry about it. You can just describe it as honestly as you can, and then let the reader 